Welcome to the Christian Ministries Church Podcast. My name is Josh Barnett. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. We're praying that this message equips and empowers you to live in the kingdom of God. Amen, amen. Woo. Like I was going to explode during that last song backstage. Just wanted to run and dance and cry and laugh. Golly. I first heard talking to Lucas about doing that song. I had kind of, I kind of forced his hand. I was like, I want to do ministry time, and here's a song I want to play. <laughs> and, uh, and he did it. But it, it, we weren't crazy necessarily about the recording, but like I had heard it somewhere else in, in a room, and I was like, man, there's an anointing on this song. And so like, we got to do it. And uh, God. <laughs> and our worship team, man, they're so anointed. <laughs> I appreciate that. That doesn't. The anointing doesn't come just from them practicing. It comes from them being in the secret place. It comes from them sitting under the word. It comes from them spending time in prayer and worship on their own. And so like, yeah, they practice their instruments, but it's also like just the anointing that you feel in the room. That is from them being faithful um, in their relationship with the Lord. And so, man, I'm so grateful to our worship team. I'd rather listen to them than anybody else. Um, well, if, if I don't know you, my name is, is Josh Barnett. I'm Associate Pastor here on staff, I'm excited about the word that I have for you today. I'm excited that it's New Year's Eve. How often does New Year's Eve fall on a Sunday? Um, not too often, but I, I, I actually, I think it's important. I think there's some significance to us meeting together on New Year's Eve. There's, there's something, it, it, it's, now, you think about it, you know, what, what Tim said was a great, like 2024, 2024 years since Christ came to the earth. Like that, that is what we're celebrating when we say Happy New Year. You think about it just in life, it's just another day, right? It's just a, we made another trip around the sun, right? All right, here we go. <laughs> we, and we nothing. I mean, we didn't, the, the earth did it. I, God made the earth move around. It's not me. I didn't do it. You know, we didn't do anything. And, uh, but, but there, there's something significant. And, and, and I really believe that God set it up this way with, with festivals and holidays and celebrations because we need them. We need them. We need at the end of a year, now, we're just moving on to the next day, but at the end of the year, it's like, okay, that year's winding down, and we're tired. We need some rest. We need some celebration. We need, we need to feast. We need to give gifts to each other. We need joy. We need these things. And so the celebration at the end of the year is really good for our hearts and our minds and our souls. It's refreshing. It's very refreshing to us. And, and, and also to even look back and go, man, what, you know, what an incredible year. Or even if the year wasn't incredible, we're ending on a high note. We're ending on a great note. And then as the year rolls over into the new year and we're saying happy new year, there's something prophetic about looking ahead to, man, this is going to be an incredible, amazing year at all that God is going to do. And so there's something prophetic in nature about moving from one year to the next year. And so I think there's something prophetic about today even that we're meeting on New Year's Eve. And I've, I've got a word for you uh, today that I believe is going to be prophetic about the way that you see this whole next year. Now, with, with the moving into New Year's, obviously people make goals and resolutions uh, about all kinds of things, right? About weight loss and eating better, um, about um, uh, which that, that one frustrates me a little bit because um, I, I love to go to the gym. I love to work out and I hate going in January. Goodness gracious. I am ready. Like when I go work out in January, I'm like, who are all these people? <laughs> my goodness. Like I get out of my gym. I'm waiting for February to roll around when they all quit. <laughs> my goodness. You, I, I don't want y'all to be healthy. Get out of here. But, uh, but we, make the, you know, we make these goals and resolutions like I'm going to eat better, um, I'm going to work out more, uh, and we, we make goals like you know, I'm going to save more money, I'm going to invest more money, I'm going to take a risk, and I'm going to move into this area of finances. We make a lot of financial goals at the beginning of the year. Um, we, you may have a, some goals at your job, you know, with your business and growth and different things. You may have some goals in your marriage with your kids. Uh, uh, spiritual goals are, are really great to have. Tim always talks to us about the beginning of the year about reading your Bible through, you know, at the beginning of the year. And some of you that are three months behind, today's your last day. So <laughs> when I'm done preaching, you better get busy. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, and, 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 and those things are, those things are good. And those things are fine. Uh, sometimes we have goals with vices. You know, you want to quit smoking, you want to quit dipping, you want to quit drinking, you want to, you want to quit doing something that's detrimental to your health. And all of those things are, you want to get off your phone more. You want to, you know, we want to do less screen time, 
all of those things. And I think all those things are great. You should have those goals and you should have those resolutions. Like new year, new you, baby, let's go. Like get, rock and roll with it. I think you should absolutely do those things. And, and I believe that we should have goals. We should plan. And we sh- and, but they're called resolutions because they're hard. You've got to have some resolve to do them. You've got to have some grit and some discipline and many of us lots of accountability to do them. <clears throat> because motivation is going to wear off. Motivation, the, we're all excited about starting a new thing until you get into it and it's not a new thing anymore. And you're like, wow, this is really hard. <laughs> it's really, really, really hard. And, um, and I just want to let you know today, like, we get into it, we find out it's harder than just talking about it. And life comes at you. And curveballs happen. I had these financial goals and then my AC went out. You know, I had these financial goals and then one of my kids got sick. I had these goals of what I wanted to, you know, I had a budget, but then the, my, my, my boss had to make budget cuts. You know, I had these financial goals and inflation. I had these, these things that I want to accomplish. And then, you know, well, what happens? Do you throw in the towel? Do you just give up? You know, the car breaks down. The economy gets worse. The, the house floods. Something happens in life. Do you just give up on it? And, and, and so my word today is to, is to encourage you. And it's also, I, I want it to be something that's prophetic that hits all of our spirit like it, it hit my spirit when God uh, first spoke it uh, to, to, to my, myself. So regarding your goals, your resolutions, your life in general, my word for you this year regarding your personal life, your personal choices, your decisions is go with the flow, man. Go with the flow. Go with the flow. And, and, and when I say go with the flow, I don't mean just let life happen to you. It's like, oh, Josh said go with the flow. So no goals, no resolutions. We'll just let life happen to us. That's not what I mean at all. I don't mean just go off the rails. I don't mean just do the easiest thing. Oftentimes going with the flow can mean choosing the path of least resistance, and that's not what I'm talking about. Um, It can mean following the crowd, following the popular opinion, and that's not what I mean today either when I say go with the flow. I want to baptize this popular idiom today the way that I I felt the Lord say it to my spirit when he first spoke it to me is go with the flow. I mean go with the flow of the Holy Ghost. Go with the flow of the Spirit. I I, I mean, rest in the finished work of Jesus. I mean, trust in Jireh. Hello? Trust in Jireh. I mean, listening to and obeying the voice of God, moving with the ebb and flow of the currents of the Spirit. Living, I'm going to say it this way, living impulsively by the currents of the Spirit. Yielding to the river that is the Holy Ghost. Now, I could just say amen and y'all roll out. That's it. That's your word for the year. But like any pastor, I'm going to drag this out for 30 minutes. So turn to John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3. My kids got new Bibles for Christmas because my wife is a good mom. Not because I thought about it. <laughs> they, got, they got new Bibles for Christmas and, and, and Sarah was telling him this morning, you better take it because what, you know, what if dad tells you to turn to John chapter three? And I was like, that's where we're going today. So awesome. John chapter three, verse five. I love seeing the little ones with their, with their Bibles. It's awesome. John chapter three, verse five, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus there. He says, very, very, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. I love that he compares it to wind here. That he compares the Spirit to the wind. You don't know where it's come from or where it's going. So is the person that is born of the Spirit. Flip over to John chapter 7. Just a few pages. John chapter 7 verse 37. John chapter 7, verse 37 says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him would later receive. I want you to see the language that Jesus uses about the Holy Ghost is important in our everyday life and what we think about God and what we believe about being his temple. The language of wind and water, specifically rivers, is very important when describing the Holy Spirit because he is talking about God in man that moves us, 
that moves us, that is flowing, a spirit that is not stationary, a spirit that is not stagnant. We are meant to move and flow with him. We are meant to be moved by his flow. And I'll say down to the smallest details of your life down to the smallest details in your life. As we live in communion with God, we live under him commanding us to do things down to the little tiny details. I'll give you an example with New Year's resolutions. So I wanna, I want to eat better. I want to, uh, I I want to lose some weight or I wanna get more fit or I wanna, you know, whatever. Well, when the, the boss has a birthday and he brings cake and pizza, Dang it, do I throw in the towel because I, no, you don't. And I I know people get frustrated about diets and whatever. And and listen, like fad diets, they, they, they can fade really quickly. The motivation to do them can fade really quickly. And oftentimes they may not even be great for you. But have you ever asked the Lord about what you're eating? Have you ever asked the Lord, this thing that I'm putting in my mouth that I'm gonna chew on, that I'm gonna partake in, is this good for me? Because the Lord knows your blood type. And he knows your body type. And he knows what's good for you. And, and listen, that's not legalism. That's just trusting God with every single part of my life. And I'm not trying to over-spiritualize anything, but I want to let you know that the Holy Spirit knows you better than anybody else knows you, better than you know yourself by far. And so he can talk to you. He, like, that's, not, that's not legalism. That's being obedient to him. That's listening to the impulses of the Spirit. You are not born of the flesh anymore. You are now born of the Spirit. Are you listening to him? Okay? And, and I want to encourage you too. Okay, well, how do I learn his voice? How do I know what his impulses are? How, do I, how am I led by the Spirit? How do I go with the flow? Scripture talks a lot about it. I mean, just read, read the New Testament and you'll see Jude 20 says, pray in the Spirit at all times to stir up your most holy faith. Pray in the Spirit at all times to stir up your most holy faith. Romans 8, verses 5 through 9, talks about how we are controlled by the Spirit because we are no longer under the law. We are no longer living by the flesh, but we are born of the Spirit. Therefore, the Spirit should control all the details of our life. In verse 26, it talks about how when we don't even know what to pray, the Holy Spirit makes groanings and utterances that are too deep for words, and it lines us up with the perfect will of God who causes all things to work together for the good of those that love him. And I want to encourage you this morning, Jude 20, Romans 8, ask God what that means, ask him to baptize you in his spirit, and you begin praying in tongues, because that will align your spirit up with his spirit, and you'll begin walking out the perfect will of God. Praying in tongues is this, is it's getting you into the flow. When I'm out of the flow, and I begin to pray in tongues, it lines me up with the flow of the Holy Ghost. Praying without ceasing. Well, I don't know if I believe in speaking in tongues. Well, just ask God if it's a gift for you, because it is. First Corinthians says it is. It is a gift for you. Ask him to give it to you. Just remain with your heart open. And I don't know about that wily man, crazy Josh up there. I don't know what he's talking about. It seems, uh, it seems kind of wild. Just ask the Lord if this is for me. I want it, God. And you watch the Holy Spirit begin to pour things into your heart. Because Luke says that if you ask God for more of the Holy Ghost, he is faithful and he will give it to you. Come on, come on. How do I go with the flow? How do I learn the flow? Philippians 4, think on these things. Fix your mind. Colossians 3, fix your mind on the heavenly realities. That doesn't mean think about the heavenly realities once a day. That says fix your mind. That means constantly concentrate on the heavenly realities where Christ Jesus is seated. Fix your mind on the things above. Galatians 5, verses 16 through 25, talks about walking by the Spirit, not gratifying the flesh, following his leading in every part of our life. Ephesians 5, 18, that was Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, talks about being filled with the Spirit. And that word filled there means filled to overflow. And verse 19 goes on to say, through singing spiritual songs to one another. And I want to encourage you too, like while worship is going on up here, we're to remain in a heart posture that is open to what God is doing in the room. Because while we're singing in this room, Paul is saying, you are being filled with the Holy Ghost. You are being filled with the Holy Ghost. So it's not just, oh man, I can't wait for the worship team to get out of the way. It's, there is, the, there is a spirit, there is a flow in the room and he's trying to fill us until we overflow so that we leave this place and rivers of living water are coming out of our belly. Come on, be filled with the Spirit. So how do I learn the flow? How do I learn the flow? Psalms 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet. 
Okay, where's the river? This Bible should be your compass. It always points north. It always tells you where the river's going. Okay, your word is a lamp unto my feet. It means it's lighting my pathway, and I go with that flow, not where I want to go. Okay, for uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, all scripture is God-breathed, and he uses it to equip and prepare his people for every good work. All scripture is God-breathed. It's God-inspired that men who were full of the Holy Ghost put pen to pad, and they were carried away in the flow as they wrote these pages. The, the Holy Spirit is still speaking to us through this word. It is alive and it is active. Are you following the flow of the word? So how do I learn the flow of the Holy Spirit? Pray, pray, talk to God, listen to God, pray in the spirit, worship, be filled, fix your mind and thoughts on him at all times. Read his word, know his word. He is still speaking. Go with the flow this year. And I I just want to teach you a little bit how to recognize, oh, sorry, I'm drooling on myself, how to recognize an impulse of the spirit. Have you ever been reading in your Bible plan and it's like a verse jumps off the page at you and it just hits you in the heart or hits you in the mind or hits you in the deep place of who you are and it's like, man, I don't know what's on that scripture, but it is speaking to me. Even though I've read it a thousand times, for some reason it's jumping off the page. Go with the flow. Stay there. Stay Now, continue on in your plan so you don't get three or four days behind. That's totally fine. But maybe keep revisiting that chapter and that verse because God is trying to teach you something. The Holy Spirit is trying to teach you something in that thing or that story or that passage or that one verse that is coming alive to you. Has anybody ever had a song, a worship song, where it's like, I don't, man, I don't know why, but I cry every time that song comes on. Or I want to run around the room every time that song comes on. Or it feels like my insides are about to blow. Like, uh, like it's, it, yeah, it's insane. That's how I feel with this Trust in God song that we're doing. My kids are like, oh, God. This song again, Dad. We get it. We, you trust in God. And like, I don't know. Like, I keep crying every time I listen to it. I don't know why, but I know there's a flow there. There's something the Spirit is doing on the inside of me as I listen to that song. So don't just have to move on to the next thing or the next newest song or whatever. Stay there and listen to that flow. If you ever feel an impression Like all of a sudden it's like, man, I really need to pray. I really need to call that person. I really need to pray with my spouse. I really need to pray with my kids. I was riding home with my three oldest kids the other day and and on the way home I was like, man, guys, I think I I wanna pray. I just felt this overwhelming feeling to pray. And we pray on the way to school oftentimes, many times not on the way home, but we were coming on the way home. I was like, man, I feel like we're supposed to pray. And I began to pray for my wife, Sarah, and I began to pray for our church. And I began to pray for all the craziness that's going on in the world. And I just began to speak prophetically over several different things. And Michael was like, dad, why do we pray? And I was like, I don't know. Just felt like the Holy Ghost told me to. And, and, and so like, if you, if you feel like God's telling you to pray with your kids or pray with your spouse or pick up that phone call and call your friend or pray with your coworker or, or, or talk to that stranger or whatever, listen to those impulses. Err on the side of obedience. And the, the kingdom is not a kingdom of caution. It's a kingdom of courage. Err on the side of obeying what God has told you to do or what you feel is on your heart to do. Listen to those impulses. Listen to those impulses where he says, hey, go this way to work today instead of this way. Well, you may just be overthinking it, or you may be listening to the Holy Ghost. The other day, uh, I keep talking about the gym, but I was working out in the gym the other day, and I felt like I was supposed to be done. There was something in me where I'm like, I should be done working out. I probably shouldn't work out anymore. Um, And I wasn't finished. Um, But I was like, man, it's just a feeling. It's whatever. And then my next set of squats, I hurt my back. Coincidence? Maybe. Or maybe it was the Spirit saying, hey, buddy, you've done too much. You're getting older. (laughs) Right? You're 34, you're not 24 anymore, all right? That 10 years, okay? Right, and so it's, but it's that ebb and flow listening to the Spirit. There's been times I've been at the gym and I felt like the Lord told me to stay longer. And then five minutes later, somebody walked in the door that needed an encounter, right? And so listen to those impulses, err on the, err on the side of believing that's the Holy Ghost telling me to do something. Get in that flow. And so when I'm talking about going with the flow, I'm not talking about letting life happen to you. I'm not talking about doing what the world's doing. I'm not talking about doing what you want to do because the flow of God is actually a restricted flow of God. There's actually, there's actually boundaries to the flow of the Lord. And I want to talk about this for a minute because in John 16, Jesus says, there's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives 
from me. The Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. He'll guide you in all truth. He'll guide you in all truth. There is real freedom found in, in submission. There is real freedom found in restriction. So I'm talking about the flow. So think about water. Water that is out of control is very damaging. We've all seen tsunamis. We've all maybe even have gone through a flood at one time, torrential downpour. You, I've seen cars washed off the road. You, we've all seen houses collapse off the side of a hill because of, of water. We've, we've seen water do some serious, serious damage. But water that is controlled does incredible things. Water that is controlled brings life to a city. Water that is controlled brings life to, a, to an environment. Life to a, a, a water to a desert will, will, will create an oasis. And so when water is directed and controlled, it brings about incredible, incredible things. And so we're supposed to flow with the Spirit. The Spirit keeps me in the boundaries of truth. If I go that way, I'm going to flood my life with anxiety, with fear, with sin. I'm going to cause destruction. But if I flow with him, I'm going to bring life everywhere that I go. When, he, when Ezekiel saw the river flowing out of the temple in, ver, in chapter 47, everywhere the river went, it brought life to all of those places. It even made the Dead Sea fresh again and brought fish back into the sea. And so that's the river of the Spirit is that it brings life everywhere that it goes. But rivers have banks. Rivers have, ex, have and, and even Ezekiel, when he was walking out and the river was ankle deep and knee deep and waist deep and, ch- and to where he would have to swim across. But there were measurements still, even in Ezekiel 47, that we see of the, rizier, of, the, the rizier, of the river where God said this much and no more, this far and no more. And so like we serve a God who has boundaries, who has restrictions, but I want you to know that the restrictions, the laws, the boundaries of God are for our blessing. They're for our blessing. And, it's, and listen, it's to launch you further than you ever thought possible. It's to do more than you ever thought you could imagine that you would able, be able to accomplish. Restriction is a good thing. Everybody in here has had a water hose on the side of your house, and you've needed to water something farther than that hose will reach. And so what do you do? You put your thumb over half that hose. And what does the water do? Shoots further. It's a law of restriction. Same thing looks like in the kingdom when we submit to the spirit and that restriction comes, it's to launch us further than we ever thought possible. And so why can't I, well, why can't I sleep with whoever I want to? And why can't I do this? And why can't I drink that? And why can't I smoke that? And why can't I do it? And why can't, why can't I just go my own way? And why don't, why don't you want me to take this job? And why do you, blah, 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 blah. stop asking why. God's trying to launch you into something. And you're going to stay right where you're at. 1 Corinthians 6 says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. God's trying to take you further and bless you more than you ever thought possible. That's why there's restrictions. That's why he said this far and no more. Because he designed life and he designed you and he gave you a plan and a purpose. It is not your plan and your purpose. It is his plan and his purpose for your life. And we're just to get under the flow and yield to the river. Yield to the river. Are you with me? (laughs) Ooh, if it feels restrictive, if it feels like pressure, if it feels like legalism, it's because you're focused on what you can do instead of what you get to do with him. It's because you're focused on what you can't do. You're focused on the vice. You're focused on the pleasure. You're focused on yourself instead of being focused on him because when you're focused on him and you see him for who he really is, there's nothing you won't give up for him. There's nothing you won't do for him. There's not anything I wouldn't give up for him. Come on. Ezekiel 36, he says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey all of my regulations. That's the spirit is in us that give us grace to obey him and follow his will. I heard the Lord told me this a few months ago. He said, he was saying this to me specifically, but he said, get your house in order. Get your house in order. And I was like, man, I feel like my house is in pretty good in order. (laughs) He was like, no, there's some things that I want to shore up in your life. There's some things that I want to reinforce, that I want to structure in your life. And listen, that oftentimes looks like New Year's resolutions, where we're restructuring and reinforcing. And I want you to know this morning, the addition of infrastructure is always an announcement that more is about to be added. 
The addition of infrastructure is always an announcement that more is about to be added. Order, structure, foundation, reinforcement is because God wants to do more through you than you ever thought possible. The greater the restriction, the greater the flow. The greater the restriction, the greater the flow. You think about um, on like a tractor or a, a backhoe or something, and they've got, they've got hydraulic lines. They've got hydraulic hoses that run from those things, and those hoses, and even, I even think about pipelines and different things, they're, they have to be, there's a certain amount in what you would call integrity that these things have. And if that integrity gives, there's even, there's even, there's whole classes that you have to take if you're in that field where you've got to know about the integrity and be able to check hoses and look for things that are maybe where it's weak here and needs to be replaced or something. The, and and, and that, that, that's a, a good thing, but, but I want you to look at it in our life is that we need integrity and character to sustain what God is trying to send through us. We need integrity and character to sustain. The greater the integrity, the greater the flow. The greater the character, the greater thing that God is going to do in you and through you. I, 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 I've been reading Genesis this week about the story of Joseph, and, and, and he was, he was uh, uh, working for Potiphar, and then Potiphar's wife kept trying to come on to him and kept running away from her and telling her no, and finally uh, she lied about him and got him thrown in prison. And it's like, God, I've been serving you, I've been saying no, I've been whatever, and I've been, I've been put in this place and taken from my position, and this feels like a demotion, but, but little did Joseph know is that he was about to be promoted and he got removed from something that he thought he was worthy of. And, he, and we don't ever see any complaining, but I just think about the thoughts that go through a man's mind when you've been living righteously and you've been demoted. And listen, if you're living righteously and you've been demoted in the physical, you've been promoted in the spiritual. And God is about to take you to new levels and new heights because he went from being uh, serving as a captain underneath a captain of Pharaoh to being second in charge of the whole nation. And because of that, he received a dream where he was able to get... Uh, uh, where, or, Sorry, Pharaoh received a dream that he interpreted, and Joseph was able to bring great infrastructure to the nation of Egypt, where they were able to make storehouses and not only feed their homes, their people, their nations, but also the nations of the world. Come on, if, God is, if you feel like God is restricting you, if you feel like God is saying no to you, it's because he's about to blow your mind. He's trying to launch you further than you ever thought possible. Another thing that comes to mind is I got into bow hunting this year. Killed my first deer. Woo, it was a doe. So don't ask me how big <laughs> it was because it was just a dough, but it was awesome. The, free, the freezer's full, right? Praise the lamb. But, uh, but, but if, you're, if you're shooting an arrow at a target, the arrow first has to be pulled away from its target in order to be launched towards its target. The same thing happens in our own life is that we have to get pulled away from what we feel like God said yes to so that he can reinforce the tension there, put the character there, put the integrity there to launch me into what he has called me to do. So will you surrender to the hands of the archer as, and listen, this is cool too, because when the archer pulls back, he pulls you closer to his face. Can you be satisfied and surrender to his touch on your life so that you can be launched to what he's called you to be launched into? Come on, come on. The cool thing about this is that you don't have to produce anything on your own. You don't have to produce anything on your own. You're not the source he is. You're not the source he is. A few years ago, we used to live um, on this trailer across the street, in this trailer across the street here. And um, I, I came in one day and we had lost water pressure. Like there was just nothing. It was just like barely trickling out, just barely dripping out. I was like, man, what's going on? Like, I can't figure this out. It was, it was everywhere. And so I, 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 we were, we, there was a well up there. And so I was going to the well and I had to turn off the power and I was checking stuff and kept having to go back and forth. I was walking all the way across the house and back outside of the well. And I was like, golly, like it took forever. And I was like, man, I don't know what's wrong. I cleaned out the filter, the pump's running. Like I hear it, like, I don't know what's going on. Why don't I have any water? Like, is the water in the ground dried up? Like, I don't know what's going on. And, uh, and I felt the, the spirit tell me like, check, just check the sink. And so I went and I unscrewed the sink and I pulled it out and that little filter that sits in that sink there was full of sediment. And so I rubbed that out and put it back on. Full power. Glory. So I went around to all the faucets in the house and it just I guess something came up in the water and, and clogged all of them up. And so and I, I rubbed all of those out. And, and listen, I, I, I want to encourage you this morning. If you don't feel like you're in the flow or you don't feel like God is flowing through you, there may be something in your heart and your mind because it's not on his end, it's always on our end. And so there may be something that you need to allow the Lord to put his hands on and rub out of you so that he can flow through you. 
Listen, God doesn't put old, a new wine in old wineskins because it'll cause them to burst because after wine is emptied of the wine that's in it, they get hard and they get brittle. And if you put new wine in it, it just bursts and comes apart. And so they would take, they wouldn't just make new wineskins. They would take the old wineskins, they would dip them in water, they would pull them out and they would begin to rub them with oil. And as they began to rub them with oil, they became malleable again. They began to get pliable again. And then they could put the new wine in. I'm about to run around this room. <laughs> preaching to myself. I'm about to get a handheld mic and go Pentecostal on you. And... <laughs> I got enough for all of you, I promise you. The problem is never the source. The problem is our filter. The problem is our mind. The problem is our heart. Water can be destructive, but if funneled the right way, it can be life-changing. The boundaries are good. <laughs> the boundaries are good. It's not go with the flow of your own life, your own ways, or with the world. It is the flow of the Lord. I just was looking over my notes this morning and, um, I, and randomly pulled up Facebook, and this quote came up, and it's like, man, the Lord's speaking to me through Facebook. Um, Leonard Ravenhill said, everybody wants to be clothed with power, but no one wants to be stripped of self. Everybody wants to be clothed with power, but nobody wants to be stripped of self. And maybe we have seen a lack of power in the church because we've been so consumed with self. And so maybe we need to have the heart of David where he says, search me, O God. Is there anything in me that offends you? Is there anything, any sediment in my heart and my mind that needs to be washed with the water of the word, that needs to be washed by the infilling of your spirit in my life so that you can flow through me even more? And, and and I think oftentimes we get, we get caught up, we get the sediment or we get, you know, I think oftentimes the sediment doesn't maybe even necessarily look like overt sin, but sometimes it's just anxiety. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's worry. And I'll say that, that, that most obedience is rooted in a mistrust or a distrust of the Lord. Is that oftentimes we don't obey him like he's calling us to obey him because we don't believe he's going to come through for us like he said he's going to come through for us. And so we, we don't trust him like we've been called to trust him. And and um, um, many of you know that my, my wife is a real estate agent, and she's bomb at it. She's so good. Real estate agent of the year, 2023, what's up? <laughs> Humble brag on my wifey. Um, she's amazing. Um, but in, uh, <laughs> in America right now, the housing market is not, like, super hot. And if you're in sales at all, sometimes it's feast or famine. And uh, we're going through a little famine. And just like looking at bills coming up and looking at things due and looking at Christmas coming and looking at whatever. And it's like, man, getting tight around here. We're going to be eating rice. <laughs> be growing our own garden this summer to make sure that we got some nuts stored up for the winter. I'm um, going to have to kill a few more deer to put food on the table. You know, we're going to have to build a fire. Um, and, uh, and I, but, I, but I found myself being really anxious because I'm looking at what's coming up. And I begin to... Th- think in my own heart that I've got to take care of it, that I've got to toil and I've got to strive. And, I, and now I'm not, I'm not giving anybody a license to make unwise financial decisions. I'm not saying that in any way, but obviously in, in life, there are bills and there are things that come due. And many times, and even, you know, even in scripture before, you know, just even looking for food each day, like who, who is your provider? Who do we trust in? And so like this, this verse, Philippians four has been going off in me for the last few months, and it's super simple. Chapter four, verse six, don't worry about anything. That's hard. (laughs) Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Period. That's the end of verse six. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about anything. Tell God what you need. And so I was like, all right, Lord, I'm just going to have that heart posture. And I'm going to say, Lord, I need you to pay my mortgage. Lord, I need you to pay my electric bill. Lord, I need you to pay my truck payment. Lord, I need you to put food on the table. And then I've been recently starting to pray bigger prayers of, Lord, I don't just want you to make one mortgage payment. I want you to pay it all off. I want you to pay it off. God, you're the financier of the kingdom. You hold it all. And so it's nothing for you, Lord, to send somebody in my life that just comes and writes me a big fat check. Right, But I have to move into a place where I'm not anxious and toiling and striving and treating everybody around me like trash because I'm worried that he's not going to come through. And I'm going to have to make it happen on my own. And so I've told him 
Lord, I need you to make this happen. And all of a sudden, business and money and a gift and a gift begins to come in. And all of a sudden, but I had to get to a place of rest before that began to happen. I had to get to a place of where I trusted in him before that began to happen in my own life. Because then verse seven says, you do these things, tell him what you need. It says, and then the peace of God will flood your heart. Tell him what you need. And then God's peace will flood your heart, which exceeds anything that we can understand. Matthew six, take no thought for tomorrow. Are you serious? Take no thought for tomorrow. He says, look at the sparrows. They neither reap nor sow, yet they always have a harvest. And if God cares for them, how much more does he care about you? Look at the lilies of the field. Solomon in all of his splendor was not arrayed as one of these. Doesn't your God care more about you than the grass that is here today and gone tomorrow? Oh, you of little faith. Come on. Can we plan? Sure, I'm not anti-planning. Can we prepare? Absolutely. Jesus isn't against planning and preparing. There are times in scripture where he calls people to plan and prepare, but what we're not allowed to do is have anxiety about the future. What we're not allowed to do is have, our faith is in him, it's not in our plan. My faith is in him, it's not in the U.S. economy. My faith is in him, not in the U.S. dollar. My faith is in him, not in my preparedness, because my preparedness and my plan could fail, but he never will. And here's what anxiety does. Anxiety makes us a slave to tomorrow. And I am treated, and and it causes me, because I live frustrated and irritated often. What it does to me is it causes me to treat my wife and treat my kids like they don't deserve because I'm, ex- I'm anxious about something that hasn't even happened. And it's showing that I distrust the Lord because I don't believe he's going to come through for me like he has time and time and time again. Come on. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans for a hope and for a future. And listen, that's not just a cute little verse that we put on a t-shirt or a mug. That is a promise for you. Listen to me, church, that God has a plan and a hope and a future for you. That is for you. You are the Israel of God. You have been grafted in. That's what Romans 11. So his promises to Israel are his promises to you. You are his children. His promises are for us when we come into agreement with them. They are yes and our amen. Well, what about hard times and what about persecution and what about all the martyrs? I don't know, but I think martyrs are probably prospering better than we are right now because they're with him and I don't think they're worried about it anymore. I don't, I don't know about the hard times, I don't know about the persecution, but I know that Paul says this, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. In the good times and the bad times, Paul learned the secret of the kingdom and it was this, in him, through him, I can do all things. Through him. He's in prison writing this, that through him I can do all things. And he doesn't seem bothered or anxious in any way. Why? Because his rest was found in Christ. In the good times and the bad times, he's working all things together for my good and his glory. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. I don't think heaven is full of anxiety right now. Right? Jesus isn't frantic. God is not wringing his hand over Israel or your bank account or that Trump got taken off some ballots. But we let that rob our peace. We let that steal our joy. And and listen, I'm all for it. I can't wait for Rick Green. I can't wait for David Barton to be here. I'm all for it about being part of the solution and turning America back to the Lord. But I'm also, in the meantime, I'm not gonna let it rob my peace. And no matter what administration sits on the throne, I'm not gonna let it rob my peace. I'll be like Daniel. And I will faithfully serve God under how, no no matter what evil king we have, no matter what evil administration we have, I will faithfully serve my God and I will go to my window and I will open the door and I will bow down three times, however many times a day he did, I'll I'll continue to do it no matter what they say. You hear me? I'm not going to let them rob my peace and anxiety, okay? So my encouragement, go with the flow. Have a seat. Enjoy the show. Rest in him. Your day didn't turn out the, lo- the way that you thought it would. I get it, man. You, you showed up at that job site and the materials weren't there. Ooh, right? You're building a home and things got delayed. You're, you're whatever. I keep thinking about real estate because that's what my wife does. But, you know, I come, in, I come into school and I think I, I work in school over here and I think everything's going to be great. And it's like everything's on fire, right? Everybody's mad at me and Stacy. God bless you. Jo- welcome to the club. Take a number. We'll be with you in a moment. But it's like, 
Okay, like, okay, it didn't turn out the way I thought it was. Like, I, man, I was all prepared for Bible class, and I was coming in, and I was ready to go, but then I got Nolan Bradshaw on the front row on his phone. I'm just kidding. He's, he's never on his phone. He's a good kid. But, but, but the day didn't turn out like the way that you thought it was. Go with the flow, man. Rest in the Spirit. Rest in the Holy Ghost. Be still and know that he is God. Don't fight it. Go with his flow. Don't resist it. Stop trying to assert control over him, over control of your life. Put your sails up and wait for him to blow on it. Wait for his wind. You should be as stressed out as God is over this next year. God is not stressed about 2024. Well, the last time they took a president off the ballot, we had a civil war. Okay. I'm going to put my pants on tomorrow like I did today. And I'm going to continue to shine bright and I'm going to continue to build the kingdom no matter what happens. And listen, Scripture teaches us His grace is sufficient for today. It's sufficient for today. It's not in tomorrow. It's here with you today. His presence is here with you today. Trust in Him. His mercies are new every morning, but there's mercy today. And, and I know that what, is my, what does my tomorrow hold? That His mercies and kindnesses are new tomorrow. Praise the Lord, and He'll be there with me too. So I'm not going to worry about that and have anxiety over that. Listen, pacing and striving is not going to bring you the break. You wring in your hands and full of all that, that's not going to bring the breakthrough. If anxiety and worry and striving and a work consciousness and all those things, if those brought breakthrough, then you would always do those things. But perhaps God is withholding something from you until you enter into the rest of his finished work. I'll give you an example. I'm going to use my wife again as an example because she's amazing. Uh, and I've shared this before. Many of you know that she's, she has had really bad sciatic pain. Her L4 and L5 have been compressed and sends just terrible pain from her hips all the way down to her feet. And, and one, of the, one of her least favorite days oftentimes was Sunday because she, when she sits down, she'd be in excruciating pain. And so I would be sitting next to her and, uh, or standing up here preaching too long, and tears are just running down her face because she's in so much pain. And she's tough. She's tougher than me. And so if she's in pain, like, it's bad. It's really bad. And um, going on for almost two years. And then all of a sudden, just noticing, like, I began to, like, ask her. Because before it was, like, obvious. Like, she's always in pain. I could just tell. And began to ask her, are you hurting? Yeah, I'm hurting. But she wouldn't complain about it. She wouldn't talk about it. And she wouldn't let it affect her mood or her emotions. And that's hard. Like, if you've lived in pain before, man, I got a toothache and I want to punch everybody around me. <laughs> but you talk about debilitating back pain. And she just got to a place where, Lord, I'm receiving my healing, and this is where I'm going to stay. And she didn't complain, and she didn't whine, and she didn't fuss, and she didn't allow it to cause the way she treated me or the way she treated the kids. And now she's been pain-free for almost a month. She didn't deny that the pain was there. She just denied its influence in her life. Right? We're not living with our head in the sand. We're just denying the influence of the problem, and we're hanging on and being obedient to what God has called us to do. So with healing, with finances, whatever it is, go with the flow. Go with the flow. Ephesians 3, I'm wrapping up. If, we're, if we go over, it's 11.59 right now, so I got, I'm almost over. But Tim, my goodness. I thought he was going to go all the way through till like, you know, give us announcements all the way through the year. <laughs> when do I need to be here next year to set up Christian decorations? <laughs> I'm kidding. He texted me last night and asked me if he wanted a stage host, and I saw the list of announcements, and I said, absolutely. I want you to stage host. Please come and do it for me. <laughs> I'm closing, though. Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21 says, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church and every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be made manifest through time and eternity. Amen. My message to you today is get under the flow. Yield to the river. There's this, I'm going to end with another example. There, there's this physics principle called the Bernoulli effect where if you've, got a, if you've got a pipe that runs or something, whenever the pipe gets smaller... So if you go from a, like a bigger pipe and it, comes, and it has to go down to a smaller pipe, there's a principle. It doesn't make sense to me, but like the pressure is greater in the bigger part than it is the smaller part. Now the force increases, 
The force increases, but the pressure is more in the bigger part. And I want, to sh- I want to tell you today, you're not the source, and the pressure's not on you. It's on him. The pressure is on him to come through. And he will come through because he is faithful. And you allow that to flow through you. That pressure begins to flow down through you and causes that force to launch out farther than you ever could imagine, ever could dream possible. The pressure's on him. You just got to open up to him and let his river flow through you. And I want to I wanna let you know today that your life should be prophetic. As you're going with the flow, you're going to work, you're with your family, you're going through the flow. Uh, uh, our youth pastor in CMC, Missouri, his name is Chaxton, uh, Chaxton, Chapman, Chapman, sorry, Chapman, if you listen to this, Chapman Laxton. He's incredible. And, and Sarah said this the other day, and it's so true about him. He's the most go with the flow kind of guy you've ever met. Whatever it is, he'll just, just jump up and do it. it, it things are falling apart. He's, been, he's come and done camp with us several years. He's just the most go with the flow. What can I do? How can I help? What can I, whatever. And nothing, it doesn't ever seem like he's ever stressed out in any way. He's just going with the flow. And I'm like, man, I want to be like that. I want to go with the flow and everything. And, it, and listen, it becomes a prophetic picture to the world around us. As we leave this place, job sites falling apart, all hell's broken loose, economy is this way, housing market is this way, whatever, and you're just in perfect peace. You're just steady as she goes. You're just going with the flow. And people are going to look at you and go, how do you have this joy? How do you have this peace? It's because I've got a source, man. And all the pressure's on him, it's not on me. You hear me? All the pressure's on him. It's not on me. How is your, your marriage should be a prophetic picture to the world around you. Y'all, y'all never fight. Y'all always want to be around each other and whatever. Like, how are y'all so happy? You still going on date nights? Like, why are you still dating? Like, what, like what in the world? It's like, I don't know, but it's God. It's God, and it's amazing, and it's incredible. Your marriage should be prophetic. I've never seen kids that behave this well. I've never seen somebody that walks. How is your business still thriving when others are falling apart? It's the favor of God. It's the favor of the Lord. How are you the same every day? How are you always healthy? I got caught up in a flow, man. You want to jump? You want to jump in? (laughs) The flow of your life should be the greatest witness of the gospel. The greatest witness of the gospel because this, and I think Christians live in this place oftentimes where we believe that the gospel start, uh, that, that the gospel stops with Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sin. That's where it starts, but it's not where it ends. It's not where it ends. The gospel doesn't end with Jesus died on the cross and saved you from your sins. The gospel ends with him walking out of that tomb, him ascending to heaven, and him sending his Holy Spirit to fill us so that we can cleanse the leper, heal the sick, raise the dead, be a light unto the world. I heard a pastor explain it this way recently. He said, if if you've got a million dollar debt and somebody walks up and gives you a check for a million dollars, glory, I'm dancing around this room, right? Somebody paid off my mortgage tomorrow, I receive it. I decree it, I declare it, I'll take it, Lord, come on. I'll receive it, and I'll dance around this room. But the gospel doesn't end with paying off the debt. The gospel is this, is that you had a million-dollar debt, and God walked up to you, and he gave you $101 million. $101 million. The debt is paid for. Now what are you going to do from it? See, we focused on so much on what we were saved from. And thank God I was saved from that, but now what? See, salvation is the beginning of an abundant resurrection life that starts now. Eternal life is now, not one day when you die. Eternal life starts now with him living in the kingdom on the earth, making the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Amen? Amen. So let's go with the flow this year, right? Finances don't work out the way, fitness or whatever. Go with the flow. Don't let it stress you out. Don't let it rob you of your peace. We're going to put our hand to the plow. We're going to see this nation turned around. But even if... It doesn't. I'm not going to let it rob my peace. I will not bow to some evil king. I will not bow to some evil regime. Even if I'm going with the flow, I'm going with the flow of the river, and it's going to be a light into the world. Amen? All right, y'all stand with me. Only 10 people walked out. God bless them. Don't let the door hit you with a good Lord split you. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord. Come on, can we give God some thanks for what he did in 2023? We're so thankful, God, for what you did this year. We're so thankful. 50 years of ministry, God, we're so thankful of what you have done in this place, in the middle of nowhere, Jesseville, Fountain Lake, Mountain Pine, Hot Springs Village, Arkansas. We're so thankful for what you're doing, what you have done in this place, the countless lives that have been changed right here because of your grace 
and your mercy, God. And we're so excited and expectant about what the new year holds for us, what the next season holds for us, because we trust in you. We trust in you. You are Jireh. You are our provider. And God, we trust that you're going to provide all that we need. And we're going to go with the flow, Lord. We surrender to the flow of your spirit. We love you, Lord. We worship you, we honor you, and we seal this word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. Happy New Year. Thank you for listening to this message from Christian Ministries Church. If this message impacted you and you'd like to sow into our ministry, you can give at cmchurch.com. If you'd like to listen to more of our messages, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Christian Ministries. God bless.